Welcome to the Energy Center of Wisconsin's one-hour webinar on an introductory to basic building science, a study of air, heat, and moisture flow. My name is John Viner. I'm a senior project manager for educational programs here at the Energy Center of Wisconsin. The webinar should take just a little over an hour, um, and the emphasis will be on um, air, heat, and moisture flow um, within our buildings and within and throughout our building assemblies. So our contents today, uh, we're going to define a system approach, how air, heat, and moisture transfer uh, through our building materials, creating effective uh, thermal boundaries, and mechanical system influences on air, heat, and moisture. And also we'll touch on how location, whether you're in a cooling climate or a heating climate, some design uh, considerations from an uh, in introductory standpoint. So a system approach. Essentially, we're making changes uh, to a home with an understanding that all parts are interconnected. And sometimes these parts, um, the building assemblies, the categories that you see here, mechanical systems, the air we breathe, um, people within the house, these are all um, really the building blocks of uh, the components of a house to make it perform well. Sometimes they're interconnected uh, significantly where one change can have large amounts of impact related to either energy efficiency or maybe it's comfort or maybe it's related to durability and pests in the home or ultraviolet light, all these things that may have uh, some damaging component to our building. Uh, we want to obviously minimize those. The air we breathe, uh, the conditioned air within the house, really connects these categories together. Uh, the fluid within our house, the, essentially it's an ocean of air that we live in. It actually has some heft to it, some weight that we have to exert and expend energy to move from one place to the other. There's uh, moisture within that conditioned air, um, there's obviously heat uh, content within that air that we have to either subtract or add heat to. It all takes energy. I mean, this ocean of air that we actually live and move through, um, oh, it's about 14 pounds per square inch, um, maybe an equivalent of about 33 feet of water that we have to essentially swim through and um, maneuver within and manipulate to create a very effective uh, high performance structure. So all these components, the building assembly, right? That's the, for walls example, that's, we have sheetrock in the inside. We might have a plastic uh, vapor retarder. Then we have some insulation type within those walls. We have wood framing, we have exterior sheathing, all those parts to that assembly really need to work well as it relates to moisture, to heat, and air movement. If we can have a very strong foundation and grasp of individual components of these assemblies and how it relates to air, heat, and moisture, well then we're on a, a long ways to achieving a, a very effective structure for the occupants of the home. Um, Controlling often means having less of air, heat, and moisture movement. Um, having less movement in and out of our buildings, essentially building a tight home, it doesn't mean that we're going to sacrifice indoor air quality. Um, we can certainly have a high level of quality, and we, you know, any high-performance house is going to have that. We w achieve the appropriate amount of air movement in and out of our buildings with controlled ventilation. We do not want air, heat, and moisture, primarily moisture from a damage function, to travel through our building assemblies, through our wall systems, through our ceiling systems, through our foundation system. So we limit that, we build a tight structure, and then we ventilate appropriately with controlled from controlled locations outside our structure into the house, we have opportunities to filtrate, we have uh, opportunities to humidify or dehumidify from a controlled uh, ventilation system. 
building performance consultants, they're the ones that really want and strive to put this system together to make sure these components interact effectively. Uh, building performance consultants generally are uh, a third party consultant that is hired, whether it's in a retrofit situation or a, a new construction, to help you put these pieces together. It's very important for someone to take this systems approach. Uh, at times, it, it can be uh, a building performance contractor, someone who's going to install your windows, going to install insulation, install your HVAC. Uh, there's high level contractors that are also doing the analysis component and putting that system together for you. But really, that has to be an emphasis when it comes to any type of change to the home is that systems approach. Take a heating contractor, for example, that pretty common to add a humidifier in a cold climate where in the winter it's very dry and they sell humidifier along with most or all of their heating systems. This practice, when it comes to a high performance house, may not be necessary. There may be times that it is, but when we take these steps automatically, we can create additional problems for, for ourselves. Or an insulating contractor that is learning about air sealing and making a house tighter without a broader view, without a systems view, we can create we can create moisture problems. We can create carbon monoxide concerns and backdrafting of chimney appliances. So somebody either within the installing organization or an outside third party taking this systems approach really is going to um, have a positive effect on any home improvement or any new residential building or commercial building being built. So we'll move into just the fundamentals of heat movement, radiation, conduction, and convection. Radiation, heat moving through space from hot objects to cold, regardless if the wind's blowing, that radiation is going to go take a straight path from one object to another. You may see this in large warehouses or grocery stores when as you enter uh, the atrium or the entryway, uh, they'll have radiant heaters above. There's a breeze going by, but you feel warm because they want to uh, uh, use the radiation heat effectively to heat you as you walk through or the objects uh, in your surroundings. Conduction heat loss, movement through contact. So we use insulation as a means to reduce conduction heat loss. So insulation, remember, is one way of controlling one way heat transfers, and that's through conduction. Convection, heat being carried along with air movement. So we have the air movement and convection. Not only do we have air moving, we have uh, moisture moving with that convective air current, and we have heat. When it comes to conduction, we're really talking about heat movement. Radiation, we're really talking about heat movement. But when it comes to convection, we have all three. We have air, heat, and moisture moving with the transfer of the air we breathe or the conditioned air um, within the home. So radiation, well, we have shortwave radiation coming directly uh, from the sun. It is the biggest source of heat movement in the universe, right? It, that ball of fire in the sky directs shortwave radiation uh, to the earth. Once it's absorbed on ob once it's absorbed by objects on the earth, it's re-radiated with long wave, wave infrared radiation. So windows, we want to protect the UV, the ultraviolet light can have damaging functions as it enters the home, fades furnitures, furniture, drapes, etc. So having appropriate window coverings are important. Um, when it comes to radiation, not only at our glass, um, we have radiation from the sun that warms up our roof system. Once our roof system is warmed up, and let's say we have a ventilated attic space and we have a good R50 
worth of insulation to reduce conduction heat loss. Radiant heat from that hot roof system will penetrate through the 14, 16 inches of a fiber fill insulation within that attic and warm up the, the backside of our ceiling, the backside of our sheetrock or gypsum board that we have um, as a finished material to the inside. So this radiation can penetrate through the insulation, hit the underside of the sheetrock, warm it up, obviously, and we have heat gain um, in a summer or within a cooling climate. This is um, a concern for us. One way to mitigate radiation heat gain um, within the attic is a radiant barrier. A little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, appropriate in cooling climates where we're going to have a foil face or something with a very high uh, reflectivity uh, installed in our attic. Maybe it's installed in our roof rafters to reduce the radiant heat gain that penetrates through the insulation warming up our ceiling and warming up the interior of our home. A radiant heat bar barrier in a cold climate can have uh, some positive effects. In a heating climate, maybe if we look at just simply economics, we may spend 50 to $100 a season cooling our homes. So from a dollar value, we're going to save a percentage of that, but a percentage, a small percentage, let's say 5, even 10 percent uh, of our cooling dollars might be $5 a cooling season. Uh, going beyond the economic issue, we can also um, obviously provide greater comfort, which uh, most people want in their homes and can have some value. Radiation affects us, affects comfort throughout the house, whether we're near windows or whether we're near a cold wall, our 90 degree approximately body temperature of our skin t temperature is going to radiate our internal energy, our heat energy from our bodies to uh, the glass surface or to a wall surface if it's cooler. We talk about windows um, because obviously they have uh, an insulating value, say, of a R3, for example, and our walls may have an R11. So that glass surface having a lower insulating value is obviously going to be colder in a heating climate when it's winter outside um, and have greater heat loss. We're going to feel greater discomfort by that window due to radiant heat loss from our bodies to that glass. Often um, we can have certainly convection, air leakage around that glass and air movement that can contribute, but often homeowners are fooled in thinking that their windows are leaky, but actual it's radiant heat loss to that glass and the reason that they're uncomfortable. So when we design a window or choose a window, whether it's in a cooling climate or a heating climate. We want to look at the solar heat gain coefficient. In a cooling climate, we really should restrict that solar heat gain coefficient, have it be lower. That is going to allow less heat gain into the structure of approximately 0.4 solar heat gain coefficient for a cooling climate or less. If we are designing a passively heated house in a heating climate, then we may have on our self-facing windows um, a higher solar heat gain coefficient. That, that extra heat gain certainly can be beneficial. We want to design that home then um, in the summer to provide shade with large overhangs or other window coverings. But in the winter, that passive solar heat gain for many of us is very beneficial and we want to allow that to come in and not restrict it. So depending on the orientation um, of the side of a house, uh, we may have different solar heat gain coefficients. It's a common practice to choose one and put it throughout the house, but if we're going to take uh, design to the next level, we may choose a variety of solar heat gain coefficients. Uh, related to the window, the other big factor, of course, is the U value, um, which is the inverse of the R value, the resistance to heat gain. 
within the U value, we want a lower U value for a higher insulating uh, capacity of that glass. Um, for federal tax credits, we want, uh, say, a U value of 0 0.30 or less. So that's uh, certainly we want to look for the Energy Star uh, label. Conduction, heat loss, or gain, right? So often in a cooling uh, climate, we're trying to restrict that heat gain. In a heating climate, we're trying to uh, reduce the heat loss from inside to out. So conduction heat loss is very predictable. A lot of um, equipment sizing, heating and air conditioning equipment sizing uh, calculations or load calculations are very good at predicting conduction heat loss. We, we have that uh, physics and the properties of materials, the way heat moves, and we can um, estimate that very accurately. Um, but when we add insulation to reduce conduction heat loss or gain, uh, let's take heat uh, loss, for example, in a winter in a heating climate. If we add that insulation and we don't look at uh, the systems approach or take a systems approach to what are the effects of adding insulation to, let's say, the interior of a foundation wall is a good one to visualize. If we insulate that concrete in a full sized basement because we're going to uh, spend more time down there. We're going to turn it into uh, a livable condition. Once we insulate to the interior of that foundation wall, that foundation wall now is colder or the, there's less heat that can reach that foundation because we've stopped the conductive heat gain to that foundation wall. The foundation wall gets colder. Uh, once that temperature drops in that concrete, but we allow air movement, um, which, as I've stated, allows moisture to travel with that air movement, comes in contact with the cold foundation wall, and we can have uh, condensation water dripping down underneath uh, the base of our wall and mold growth, et cetera. So without a broader systems view, um, we can create issues. Bottom line is, if we insulate, we can increase wetting potential and decrease drying potential without having an effective air barrier in front of that insulation. Very key to uh, um, insulating, uh, to make that insulation work well and not create damage uh, related to moisture, we need a good air barrier in front uh, of that insulation and having it sealed on all sides. Insulating techniques. As I just stated with the foundation insulation, insulating without a good air barrier, or insulating poorly um, with gaps and voids. Uh, as you can see, as we look up at this floor system, the gap that there does not allow for um, effective insulation or conductive uh, heat loss reduction. That insulation needs to be in contact with the surface that it's insulating. We might see this above garages or in cantilevered floors. And uh, this is obviously either it was installed correctly at one point and it has fallen down or it just never was installed correctly. But uh, this isn't doing anything for us. We actually can have uh, miniature convective loops uh, between the floor above and the insulation, which is going to rob uh, or uh, rob the effectiveness of that insulation. When it comes to, again, insulating and moisture concerns, we can see on my left side of the screen the mold in the ceiling, uh, just some dark staining. And on to the right side, you can see what a thermal imaging camera is going to show us. That's the, an infrared image. The darker uh, the image, the colder that surface. So as we as we see these moisture-related problems, there's a tendency to ventilate more and to move uh, a little too quickly to ventilation as a strategy for solving problems. But uh, we need to take a step back and identify whether it's high humidity or whether it's a cold surface. As in this case, as we see here, the uninsulated ceiling above, as we can see by the dark patches with the infrared camera, creates a cold surface. Um, aggravates condensation, 
uh, a longer wettering period within the house, high humidity at that surface, and mold will begin to grow. Here, I popped in the picture on the right-hand side where from the attic, we can see the uninsulated section that was causing the mold to grow. This wasn't um, because uh, we had high humidity in this bedroom. Um, it was actually, we didn't have enough blocking at the eave, and as wind washed up through the soffit vents, it blew the loose fiber insulation away from the exterior wall and created a mold issue, a mold problem for this homeowner that needed to be solved. It's really keeping that surface warm to solve a moisture problem in this case. Peeling paint, again we have to, this is in a bathroom looking up at a skylight. Is this peeling paint that we have within the red circles due to high humidity or a cold surface? Really it's in this instance, it is a cold surface. I'm not going to say it's not always. Sometimes it's high humidity. Most often it's a combination of both, and we have to take multiple approaches to solve uh, these types of concerns for the homeowner. If we take a look from the attic side, here we can see how that bathroom skylight was insulated. We have, we have significant R value, significant thickness of insulation around that uh, skylight, though it's installed improperly, without a good air barrier. So we have, we're allowing that very cold attic air to penetrate in and around, around the edges, around the sides of the fiberglass that we see here, create the cold surface to the inside of that skylight where it's visible to the homeowner and the paint is not able to stay in place because of the dampness, because of the uh, relative humidity that is occurring on that sheetrock. Again, we need a very high quality air barrier. We do have some foam sheathing, you can see, a couple of different styles. Some is silver, some is blue. It doesn't matter all that much. As long as it would have been effective, it would have worked and not create created the peeling paint to the interior. One solution for that will be spray foam. It's not, um, it's not the only way to approach the situation, but essentially peeling back all the insulation, starting from scratch, and having that spray foam really act as our insulating, our thermal uh, boundary around that skylight and be a really good air barrier. So now we have the insulation barrier or boundary and the air barrier all together, right? They're acting as one. Um, they're right adjacent to each other, right where we need it to be. Adding an additional bath fan would not necessarily have solved this problem. The root cause it is a cold surface and a poor insulating uh, technique, aggravating conductive heat loss. Convection, right, that's the third way um, we're going to discuss of heat movement in and out of our buildings. We talked about radiation. We talked about conduction. This is convection. Really air movement that takes place when a difference in density exists or a difference in temperature. Uh, the warmer the temperature, the lighter, the less dense uh, the air is, the colder, the more dense. So when we have a location by a window, for example, where the air passes through a window or passes to the inside surface of the window, the air cools off, becomes dense. It sits and pools down uh, maybe where a child is playing or where your feet are located sitting on a rocking chair and your feet are cold and we need to maybe put an extra layer on. That convective loop drives heat loss. We take the warm air that uh, rises, comes to the contact with, could be a wall, could be a window, and sets up a pattern for us that aggravates heat loss. The convective heat loss or gain, though it can take place without any air movement in and outside the structure, just like by the window, or let's take a chimney chase, for example, or let's take, I think my next slide here, we have a drop soffit box, let's say in the kitchen. So we have 
the red arrows that are showing air movement from the attic down into the soffit box and warms up by the uh, maybe say conductive heat gain from the house into that box becomes less dense it rises back through the insulation because we don't have a solid air barrier across the ceiling level the plane of the ceiling the sheetrock the finished uh, interior wraps around that soffit box if that soffit box is airtight then we're, we don't have air from the interior of the house leaking out though it's still important to stop this convective loop of cold air or hot air falling and settling and moving in and out of this drop soffit you can see I next to the red aerials I just uh, inserted a blue line at the ceiling plane and we still want to seal it there to prevent heat loss or heat gain at that soffit box into the interior essentially this is aligning the air barrier now up against the insulation It's where it needs to be that's where uh, it should be installed from the very beginning one question that often arises whether it's a new construction or remodeling is whose responsibility is it to do that to put that air barrier in place next to the insulation should it be there before the insulators get there or and essentially being the framers responsibility or should the insulating contractor know enough um, to put it in place and be his responsibility it really needs to be uh, discussed and spelled out with any work scope for the construction trades often it's easier just for the framer uh, to put this blocking in place and the insulator can insulate that's what he likes to do and we just let him go about his business after uh, we take care of the fine details to make sure it's going to function appropriately so convection and airflow air leakage into and out of the home it does depend on the pressure difference inside the house compared to outside the house how strong is that and how big is the hole the direction of the airflow is always from wherever the higher pressure source is to the lower pressure source so we can we can start diagnosing problems and directions of airflow without feeling a breeze on our face we have very sensitive pressure gauges that can measure that and tell us whether air is going one way or the other the the blower door test where we're measuring air infiltration into a building uses the same principle the blower door the large fan that we set up in a front door for example and we exhaust air to the exterior and it quantifies the amount of air rushing through that fan when we tur turn up the rheostat we turn it up to a point where we have a standard test pressure and the fan has a known hole size we adjust the opening to what we think is appropriate for uh, our standard tests and we from there we can calculate the volume of air moving through that fan because we know the the pressure difference across that fan the hole and we know the whole size of that blower door so then it's relatively easy then to say we have uh, 2,000 or 3,000 cubic feet per minute of air moving through that fan the same as with uh, measuring exhaust fans there's a, a very simple tool to measure and quantify the amount of air being exhausted through a bathroom fan or a kitchen fan it's essentially a box with the appropriate dimensions that has an adjustable hole so we adjust it to a known hole size and we use a very sensitive digital pressure manometer pressure gauge that measures static pressure in either inches of water column or another metric unit would be Pascal's and we can go to uh, quick charts to show us what the flow is or we can have uh, digital manometers that are going to read out the flow directly but it's all based on the principle of knowing the pressure difference across the hole and the size of the hole 
airflow measured in cubic feet per minute. So the CFM into a building equals the CFM out of the building. So air really acts like an incompressible fluid. We know that air, a gas, can be compressed, but really in a, within our homes that air doesn't really act like it's compressible. The air that comes in really flows out the next hole or on the opposite side of the house. And hence, CFM equals CFM out. It doesn't, if the wind blows hard or air enters the home, it doesn't get all bottled up on one side of the house and create a big strong pressure on one side and a weak pressure on the other side. Um, it may to some extent, but it's not significant. The amount coming in is going to flow out the next, next hole or the easiest path that it can. So a clear sign of air movement. I think many have seen this before, just the dark staining on our pink fiberglass insulation. We have a, a plumbing stack there, the white PVC pipe, that well, we can predict that there's going to be a hole where that pipe penetrates a top plate, for example. This is air being exhausted either um, 24 hours a day through what we'll call stack effect or it's fan-induced air movement or it's wind-induced movement and we're going to talk about those driving forces in a minute but clearly we have air in and out of our structure and through our building assembly which as I stated earlier we want air movement in our buildings but we don't want it through our assemblies through passing through our sheetrock, passing through our insulation, through our wood structures, because it can carry uh, things that we don't want, such as moisture, and then we can get condensation, et cetera. So we really want that controlled source of ventilation, where that movement, where that air is going in and out. Plugging the hole, um, this, we may do this for energy efficiency, but some of the greatest benefits is really the durability and preventing a wet attic where we get mold growth, et cetera. So we have, we, we increase comfort, we increase energy efficiency, and we increase durability by plugging these houses, pl plugging the holes, excuse me. We, we're making houses tighter to solve problems. We're not creating problems by making houses tight. As long as we uh, have a little bit of skill, we have the knowledge to take a systems approach, we do some performance testing to understand the quantity of air movement in and out of our structure and where it's going. We're going to be just fine by making that house um, a little bit tighter than we're uh, typically accustomed to. Stack effect, wind and fans, these are really the primary driving forces that's moving this air, heat and moisture through our building assemblies in and out of our, our structure. You know, how much control do we have over wind, um, over the stack effect, which essentially is warm air as the rising, as it's colder outside in a cooling climate, or excuse me, let's take a heating climate, for example, and it's uh, zero degrees outside and it's um, 70 degrees inside, we have this buoyancy of the warm air inside pushing at the top level of our uh, house on the top floor, wanting to go out um, every top plate penetration or recessed light that we have. This happens 24 hours a day if it's colder outside than inside. Now if we take a cooling climate and we take Florida for example and we have uh, a single story house and it's 100 degrees outside and 70 degrees inside the opposite can occur and I have a, a nice demonstration that we'll show here in a little bit that will actually give us a good sense of stack effect and how it comes into play in our structures. And we'll do that in just a minute. Fans, of course, that's typically going to be uh, forced air furnace heating systems, so the blower motors or exhaust fans or other ventilation type systems within our house. We have some control over those, but often they're just a necessary component. We have to move the air heat um, the conditioned air throughout our structure. So we need that blower to operate. Maybe we can adjust the speed level, but generally it's 
not approach to mitigate air leakage in and out of our building by adjusting the furnace fan speed, for example. That really has other parameters that it needs to be set at and by. Exhaust fans, maybe we have uh, a safety concern or too much exhaust can create a carbon monoxide concern. It may be possible to eliminate or reduce fan speeds as long as ventilation is appropriate to minimize the effect exhaust fans have on our chimney. But uh, for the most part, we have little control over these driving forces. We really want to plug the holes. That's the best way to control air, heat, and moisture in and out of our buildings. As I said, the fans can affect safety in our home, and this is a performance test that needs to be completed really on any structure that has an atmospherically vented combustion appliance, essentially a chimney that relies on the buoyancy of air to rid the flue products um, up and out of our, our house. Carbon monoxide detectors on each floor of our homes are an important component, even with attached garage. So safety is number one. We have to remember it's all about the occupant and making sure that uh, they're safe and they're comfortable and they're not going to get exposed to uh, other types of uh, durability concerns such even as pets, so pests. Um, bugs and insects, when moisture becomes too high, we know that the bugs start coming out and the, we get uh, the earwigs or the other insects um, that we're going to find, the silverfish type of uh, insect that we see in a uh, heating climate. Um, finding those in our homes when the relative humidity gets too high. Or if heat escapes, say, into a crawl space, rodents, we want to, they're going to find a nice, warm, comfortable place to stay. So it's all about the occupant. We need to control the air, heat, and moisture um, to provide that level of comfort uh, that homeowners expect. So here's the C stack. Uh, stack effects simulation uh, software. It's really a neat demonstration uh, software tool to take a close look at airflow and pressures due to uh, the stack effect and it has the capacity to look at airflows due to um, ventilation systems within our home. I'd like for you to focus on the upper left hand uh, corner. You can see that I have it right now uh, marked as a two-story house and the air leakage rate is 2,000 CFM50. Let's just call that average or, or medium uh, leakage rate for this um, existing structure, two stories. You know, maybe it's a 1980s, 1990s house. It doesn't matter. Um, down on the bottom left, you can see the inside temperature is 68 degrees as I uh, point my cursor uh, to the inside. And just below that, I move my cursor to... Um, the outside temperature, which is currently 68 degrees. I'm going to move over to the right on this software, and we can see this is going to show us some pressures here. Right now it's zero at the bottom of the house and zero at the top of the house. Those are pressure measurements in pascals. So let's just get something to take place here. So the outdoor temperature, I'm going to move and make it colder outside. So I'm going to move it, let's say it's 24 degrees outside and we still have inside temperature of 68 degrees. What happened? We can see the blue bars that came into play on the right-hand side low in the structure. We have a negative 2.7 pascals of infiltration low in the structure. And if we follow up, we can see um, high in the structure, we have an exfiltration. That's where the air is moving. Remember. Air is acting as a really an incompressible fluid as air enters, in this case, low in the building. It's exiting high in the structure. You can see there's a yellow line there. It's called the neutral level or the neutral pressure plane. That's really where, in this building simulation, the neutral pressure plane is in the center of the home. It doesn't always happen that way. It's just for simplicity's sake. That's where it is. There's no infiltration or exfiltration at the first floor level. It's all taking place down in the basement, exfiltrating out on the second floor 
um, high in the structure. What happens if we make this home uh, a one-story structure? So I think I can make it a one-story, and you look up upper right now, it's a one-story house. Our pressures got lower. I make it a two-story, and our pressures get higher, and we have here you can see in the green, that's a CFM. That's a quantity measurement of cubic feet per minute infiltrating and, of course, exfiltrating in and outside the house. So the, the smaller the structure, the less height we have, the less pressure, the less driving force due to stack effect um, increasing or decreasing our uh, infiltration. Let's say that we're in Florida. So now we're in a, a cooling climate. I'm going to move the outside temperature bar to, let's say, 100 degrees or so. We got 99 degrees outside, and it's cooled to 68 degrees on the interior. Look at the blue bars. So the opposite has just occurred. We have a slight positive pressure in the basement with respect to the exterior, and we have pressure pushing in the interior air pushing to the outside an infiltration occurring high in our structure in this two-story house infiltrating through the recessed lights if there are some in the second story of the house and exfiltrating um, out the rim joist or out any uh, walkout basements windows and doors that we have in our lowest part of our structure um, and let's just take a single story house so if I this is in Florida really hot day out we have a slab on grade building and we take a look at our pressures and flows due to stack effect only. The one driving force, remember there's three of them, stack effect. We have our fans that blow air around in the house and we have wind. Due to stack effect, we have very low pressure in the single story slab on grade in Florida home. We have 56 CFM. As I move my cursor here by the green, uh, figure that's 56 CFM out on the low 56 in. We'll come back to this software tool to demonstrate what if we have an exhaust only ventilation system. What does that do to pressures and flows within the structure? Within the structure, or if we have a balanced ventilation system, a heat recovery ventilation system, or has been referred to as an air to air heat exchanger, does that? Uh, change pressures within the structure and we'll get to that near the end of the presentation. So the next, we're going to move on to the basics of moisture movement in the structure. We spend a fair bit of time on heat movement through radiation, conduction and convection and the driving forces of stack effect, wind and uh, fans and we're going to talk about mechanical systems and fans also here a little bit later. So moisture movement, water. We got bulk water, that's rain, right? We have, to, we have our roof system, pours off onto the roof, hits our gutters, downspouts, and out, hopefully drains away from our structure. We have capillary action, another way that uh, water, moisture, moves into our structure. Air transported water vapor. So this is really the, uh, the key here is understanding um, where the holes are, what are the driving forces, and when they, we have air movement, we have moisture movement. Vapor diffusion, that is water molecules that are so small that they penetrate sheetrock, for example, or they penetrate actually a vapor retarder. Plastics can allow some level of vapor diffusion, though it's very small, it's there, and we have to recognize it and work it into our designs. So rainwater, we're collecting that water off the roof, into our gutters, down our downspouts, having our kickouts at the end of our downspouts, four, six feet out away from our structures, and we keep a good slope away from our foundation systems. A lot of interior moisture problems can come about, whether you're in a cooling or a heating climate, because the foundation walls are wet due to uh, improper grading downspouts, etc. It's very simplistic in the idea of how to manage this rainwater, but maybe it's too simplistic because sometimes it's often just simply forgotten. 
Now, off our roof systems and how we may divert it into our, our gutters and our downspouts where we're at the edge of a roof where, let's say, we have a second story um, adjacent to a single story roof, this kick out flashing, this becomes really important so the rainwater doesn't wash down um, onto the envelope into the uh, exterior cladding of the home. You can see that we have pan flashing or step flashing here that it's called and it's tucked up underneath any type of house wrap or foam insulated sheathing so that we're actually as the water hits this plane it runs onto the step flashing or the pan flashing kicked out to the gutters and down. Actually we have also a drip out a drip edge flashing here ahead of the gutters. Um, just all excellent strategies to make sure that we manage that rainwater. Capillary action. So really it's bulk moisture movement into small spaces due to surface tension. This is if we have a gap that's a quarter inch or, or less, we can have droplets of water that is able to travel uh, upward in nature. It doesn't, uh, isn't going to flow down and out like we want it to. It's trapped. The water um, is able to grab onto these surfaces in small spaces and actually move in directions that uh, we prefer that it did not. Such uh, the capillary action, the big one, of course, is concrete and our foundations are able to wick or utilize capillary action to bring moisture from the exterior into our home. Lap siding, a wood lap siding or cladding on our uh, exterior of our homes um, also has, has the potential to have gaps that allow the wicking and capillary of action to get behind the cladding. Remember the cladding, um, it does not stop 100% of water when we got wind and rain blowing on our siding, some gets behind the siding and if we don't allow some level of space between the cladding and our exterior sheathing, water will sit there for some amount of duration. Will it cause a problem? I, have, I do not know. It, it doesn't happen um, always where we have large amounts of damage. We just want to do what we can to prevent um, the risk, right? We want to lower the risk. So capillarity, we have our foundation, we have gravel, we have a, a perforated drain pipe down around our, our footing and coarse gravel. Sand, of course, around our footing is going to hold moisture and allow a greater amount of capillary action and uh, the, the wicking of moisture from the sand, the surroundings of our footings and our foundation walls into our concrete foundation, which we don't want because then it's uh, on its way to the interior. Um, so avoid sand, coarse gravel, three-quarter inch gravel is a great product to put around our foundation to eliminate or to reduce capillary action. So another way to reduce capillary action, and I'm going to uh, toggle through the last slide and this one, so you can see we have capillary action with the red arrow, and then if you look down at the footing, um, we can see what we'll call a capillary break where the foundation wall rests on the footing itself. This key way we can put in a break, it could be a waterproof membrane that uh, separates the foundation wall from the footing. It's an excellent way to prevent this moisture travel transport from the outside of our structure to the interior. Lap siding again, uh, excellent wall strategy. Um, is furring strips behind the cladding. This creates a space for wind-driven rain when it gets behind there, behind the cladding to drain out and um, away from our structure. Really, it's when we design our assemblies, it's all about the ability to dry. Right? It's going to get wet at some point. When and how will it dry and how long will it take? And will the materials be able to hold some level of moisture? It, some moisture gets into the wrong places and we don't have issues, it dries. Sometimes we don't, again, managing risks. This air transported water vapor, right, it's a primary mechanism for water to go where we don't want it. 
It relies on an air pressure difference in a path. We talked about the pressure difference and the hole that it needs for air to move, to carry the moisture to the wrong place. Um, controlling this airflow is obviously key. key. Worry less about controlling the driving forces and the pressures. Plug the hole. Here's an example of a home uh, that I was in that really we had water dripping onto the interior around the chimney chase. We can see on the left-hand side, within the red circle, water staining on the concrete block chimney. Lots of waterproofing on the flashing on the exterior of the home, but they could not stop moisture dripping, condensation, um, and water staining on the inside of this home. It's humidity from the bathroom below. You could actually see little penetrations and look into the bathroom and that moisture finding its way into the attic, condensing on a cold surface and dripping back down, creating the water staining. On the right, the solution obviously is to plug the hole. This was a big hole. Not only did we solve the water staining below, but we reduced energy bills, increased durability of the structure, and um, reduced the, or increased the energy efficiency of the home. All with this one measure. Dramatic effect. Um, can't say enough, obviously, about plugging the holes. The bulk water and water vapor often go hand in hand, so that's what makes solving these types of moisture-related concerns um, a little more challenging, a little more enjoyable a puzzle to solve, is that it's often not one item, one measure that's going to um, take care of the concerns for the homeowner. You really have to put a number of pieces together. For example, um, we may be dehumidifying within the basement, but we're really not dealing with the root cause. It's, again, the exterior rainwater not being managed in many cases that that water finds its way into our foundations, into our basements, and then shows up somewhere else within the house. Here's a, a good pictorial that's going to give us a, a clear indication of what's going on. We have bulk water movement um, with a no kick out from the downspout, dropping the bulk water down at our uh, base of our building. It does travel along our building and gets soaked into our foundation. As the top photo on the right, in the red box, we can see uh, water uh, being soaked into the concrete, and that does add to the humidity of the home and cause wa window condensation. So we want to deal with the root cause when it comes to really solving, obviously, any types of concerns that we have. Vapor diffusion, the movement of moisture vapor from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. I use pressure uh, one other time related to air movement, right? There's an air pressure difference and there's also a vapor pressure difference. Two different, two different forces. We can have an airflow or a pressure difference pushing air to go in one direction and a vapor pressure difference forcing moisture to go in the opposite. Airflow is from a high pressure to a low pressure, just like Vapor pressure is from higher vapor source, higher vapor pressure, to an area of lower pressure. Let's see, for an example, might be a bathroom. As we take a shower and the moisture builds up, that vapor pressure forces its way, say, underneath the bathroom door to the rest of the house because we have a higher vapor pressure in the bathroom to the rest of the home. We may be due to wind, we have a window cracked open and the airflow may be coming from the main body of the house under the door out a window. We have airflow going to the exterior and moisture going to the interior. It can go either sometimes together or sometimes opposite. All depends on whether it's what the vapor pressure is, high to low, air pressure, high to low. the perm rating. So this is how we measure um, the ability of a material to move or restrict vapor diffusion. Porous materials 
for example, sheetrock is very porous. It may have a perm rating of about 50. And generally, a porous material is greater than 10. Um, vapor barriers or vapor retarders, things that are going to restrict um, water vapor movement and diffusion, are going to have a very low permeability of 0.1 or less. Now, all our components within a certain assembly, whether it's a wall assembly or ceiling, they all have um, a variety of permeabilities and understanding the sheetrock, the vapor retarder, the insulation, that type that we're using, uh, the exterior sheathing, understanding the permeability of those is going to really allow us the direction um, that wa vapor diffusion the direction that water vapor is going to travel. Which way? Are we going to have drying potential through vapor diffusion to the interior of the home or will it be to the exterior? Standard construction puts that vapor barrier often to the inside of the building. That's going to restrict vapor drying potential through vapor diffusion to the inside of the home and we want to rely on it to the exterior. Again, is how is that building assembly going to dry? And we know that drying potential is going to hinge on vapor diffusion and permeability of materials. It's going to depend on heat flow in and out of those materials uh, through air movement um, in and out of those materials. Um, and well, radiation, I would say, isn't going to play as big a role when it comes to drying potential other than obviously when the sun's out and it's beating on an assembly, that's really going to provide some level of drying. Here we have an example of a vapor barrier in a heating climate on the wrong side of a wall system. So I'm looking from the attic and someone installed a plastic vapor retarder to the outside of that wall assembly on the attic side and that plastic is all wet. Now this vapor diffusion, even though it's relatively small in comparison to vapor transported through air movement, Vapor diffusion can cause issues and problems and the sheetrock being tight on the inside of this closet that we're looking at here, um, at least at the back side of this closet, that it really appeared to be more of a vapor diffusion concern and a lack of drying potential to the exterior because we put plastic um, on the outside of this wall assembly. So solving common moisture problems Obviously, we need to control moisture sources, and this is controlling bulk water through rainwater. Um, obviously, what uh, moisture sources within inside the house we want to um, reduce or control. We don't need to eliminate the amount of plants or the pets that we have in our house. Our buildings should be built to handle um, some of these sources of moisture. But there are times when putting the system together we do have to reduce um, what we're doing on the in interior. Drying clothes in the basement, for example. There may be houses with enough air leakage that can handle that, but in a high performance house, we may see uh, problems hanging clothes on the line to dry in the basement. And a dryer just might be a better strategy. We talked about keeping surfaces warm to reduce moisture problems not rushing to ventilate and increase infiltration and exfiltration to dilute any interior pollutants, which would inclu may include moisture, but really do a good job insulating and air sealing to keep surfaces warm. The appropriate materials, understanding the permeability of materials and how we want those uh, assemblies to dry. We need to put the vapor barrier or retarder in the right places in the correct way and understand um, the assembly as a whole. Creating effective thermal boundaries, right? I, I touched on this in bringing the insulation and the air barrier together. And what I mean is that we have insulation and then we need the air barrier up tight to it. Too often they're very separated by a gap, by a space, or maybe by a void um, within an assembly not the best strategy. We've got to bring them together. And one place where I often see the 
a misalignment of the thermal boundary and the air barrier may be at the eaves, or this may be a, a story in a half house with uh, knee walls, and we're insulating um, on the rafter bays, and there's a storage area in that knee wall, and we don't really complete the thermal boundary or the air barrier down above the exterior wall top plate. Here's an example so of spray foam actually doing an excellent job again to bring the thermal boundary and the air barrier in line together, making it complete over the exterior wall top plate, and below that top plate we have the wall insulation. So we have a great continuous thermal and air barrier. Um, we have some floorboards removed here by within the red circle and the problem that occurs is that the floorboards do not get removed and the insulator will just take it um, to the floorboards and not between the floor joists out over the exterior wall top plate completing uh, the circle you might say around the house. Here's another area split level. We have a, a ceiling that's a little bit higher on the second floor or we have a, a split level home and if we're standing in the attic or kneeling in the attic on the rafters of the lower ceiling we can reach our arm down into this interior wall cavity and this interior wall cavity I've seen it go all the way to the basement to the mechanical room because it's a, a great chase to run electrical wires and plumbing uh, pipes so this is a misalignment we have the insulation is in place but the air barrier is just simply lacking in this case. So we need blocking. Uh, when we come into split level homes, this is a, one of the first uh, areas that we often take a look at to make sure that um, the air barrier is in place at the same plane adjacent to the insulation. We cut maybe, we can use two by four blocking or we can simply use cardboard cut with a utility knife stapled in place and caulked around the edges so that it's nice and airtight. Once we do that measure in the home, testing and verifying becomes key. If we're going to provide a, a quality service to the homeowner in solving problems or simply making the home more energy efficient, having the blower door running while we do this air sealing, aligning the, or placing the air barrier where it needs to be, and then turning on the blower door, having a smoke pencil, and making sure that the smoke doesn't go through uh, around our seams, around our any gaps that we may have left in place. Performance testing is key when we come in to solve these types of concerns and must be done. So we always have choices and there's a lot of circumstances out there that um, arise where we are gonna have to decide whether the insulation goes here or the insulation drops a little bit lower on the stairway for example. Right now, in this slide, we have an insulated hatch. So the thermal boundary is in pink. But really, we can do it either way and really have a, a, an effective, high-performance structure if now we insulate along the stairway, along the interior wall. So I'm going to back up. We can, we can have it at the attic hatch, or we can have it down the stairway. What is the crew comfortable with? We just need to get a good job done regardless of the strategy and that house is going to work just fine. As we move or replace thermal boundaries, some of the things that we need to think about is cost. You know, how much is it going to cost to uh, move the insulation in a story and a half bungalow from the roof rafters to the knee walls, for example? because we're going to ventilate that space, it's wet in there, we want to make some changes. Or the homeowner um, wants to uh, condition an attic space and we have to move the insulation from the floor to the roof rafters. We have to give the homeowner a good idea of what the costs are um, to make those changes so that they can um, make an appropriate choice. How easy is it, occupant use, the heating and cooling system size has to come into play because now we're um, conditioning a larger volume within that structure. One of the bigger concerns can be the distribution system locations. So this would 
fall back to a forced air furnace and we have ductwork. Um, in an attic space, maybe it's in an attic space currently and it's very leaky, we have lots of holes and we're heating a knee wall attic space and we have rodents in there because it's a very comfortable place to be. And it's uh, not, a, not a nice habitable space at this time with the rodents in there. So if we want to um, condition that space, it, that's maybe advantageous to do because we have leaky ductwork. We have the choice to seal the ducts or move the thermal boundary out to make that increase the efficiency of that duct system. Mechanical systems um, effect on house pressure. So this is really we're going to move from moisture we talked about, bulk water, capillary action, air transported water vapor, vapor diffusion. We talked about effective insulating practices, alignment of the thermal boundary essentially getting the insulation and the air barrier together and make them both uh, effective. The last section is on mechanical systems, essentially the driving force that uh, we called fans. You know, how do these fans within these mechanical systems, how and why do they change pressure and exasper exasperate, um, exaggerate air heat and moisture movement in and out of our structures? So ideally, there'd be no house pressure changes when the furnace fan came on. If we have good design, we have a good envelope that's tight, good duct distribution design, and there it's free of air leaks. Whatever blows out of the supply registers is pulled back into the cold air returns, and we have no net pressure change within that structure. It does happen, but quite often, some level of pressure change takes place when that blower comes on at some somewhere within that home. Um, just many variables that come into play, whether it's door closures or poor duct design, um, that's going to make this occur. It doesn't mean that we're going to have problems. It doesn't mean that we're going to have big imbalances within the structure um, increasing exfiltration in a room because we have a slight positive pressure in a bedroom. There are some guidelines that we go by to try not to overly pressurize a structure or um, negatively uh, pressurize a structure. A uh, common guideline in the units of Pascal's is plus or minus three. So we don't want greater than three Pascal's, say in a bedroom when we close the door compared to the hallway that we're standing or within the main body of the house. It's a guideline. It, if we exceed that, it doesn't mean that there's big concerns or big issues necessarily, but it's as much a, of a guideline to be aware that let's do what we can to keep it within that. So in this photo, we can see on the left-hand side, if we have a room that only has supply air um, blowing into the room, no cold air return, mm, a common bathroom for example, we, we have the potential to pressurize that structure or, or pressurize that room. We're going to blow heat into it, pressure will build up a little bit in that room if it's a tight structure and we don't have uh, other types of uh, passageways for that room to escape. We'll talk about some of the pros and cons of that here in a little bit. On the opposite side, the return side, or excuse me, on the right side, a balance system, we would have a supply going in and a return coming out, and we can achieve a very little net pressure change within that room, and that's what we want. If we have, um, let's say some of the ductwork runs through an attic space, and we have a disconnected supply duct, and we're blowing conditioned or heated air from the furnace into the attic, that has the capacity to create a negative pressure within the home. The cold air return is going to suck harder in that space and create a negative pressure with that blower motor because it can't get everything back that it's pumping out because we're pushing that conditioned air, heated air into an attic space that can't find its way back into the home. 
The opposite occurs if we have a cold air return leak in an unconditioned space. We can have um, positive pressures within the structure that can also create problems. There's pros and cons, and we'll get to those in just a second. Ventilation systems. So these are, again, those fans. We have exhaust only, supply only, heat recovery ventilators, and energy recovery ventilators. They all do slightly different things within the home. Exhaust only systems. These are the bathroom exhaust fans. A lot of, or I didn't even say majority of the Wisconsin Energy Star homes that are built have exhaust only ventilation. They rely on a continuous duty exhaust fan with a uh, very low sewn, quiet uh, rating. And their houses operate just fine. They don't upgrade to a balanced ventilation system. It can work fine. The, probably the, the next um, common ventilation system in our homes here in Wisconsin under the Energy Star program is either going to be the heat recovery or the energy recovery uh, ventilation system. Supply only is, is utilized where we bring fresh air from the exterior into the home, often connected to the cold air return of our forced air furnaces. So we pick a location where we're not drawing pollutants along a driveway or near the garbage bins on the exterior of our house, but an area that we're uh, six, ten feet away from any type of pollutants that we can recognize. And when the furnace fan comes on, we draw air into the home. So we're bringing excess air into the structure. In theory, that provides a little bit of uh, positive pressure throughout our structure. Um, often it's um, hard to recognize or even measure, depending on the design of the system. Um, but it has that potential. The heat recovery ventilation system, again, it's a balanced. The amount of air we draw in is expelled out, and we should have no net pressure change within the structure. Similar to the energy recovery ventilation system that not only recoups the heat as the HRV does, it recoups moisture either from inside the structure or from the exterior. So as we, this heat exchanger um, that also transfers moisture is going to transfer the moisture wherever the highest source. If we have higher humidity levels inside the house, it's going to give up moisture to the incoming stream. Vice versa, if we have higher humidity on the outside of the structure and that air is coming in, it's going to give up moisture and heat to the outgoing airstream. Again, these are great systems uh, to provide um, greater capacity in ventilation. Great controls are available, really, for any of these ventilation systems. Um, we have a, a wide variety of control options, whether it's timers or based on humidistats or continuous operation. Um, they all have that ability. Exhaust only, some advantages in a cold climate. As we exhaust air out, we're going to pull air in. The advantage or the to this is that we may cold pull in the drier wintertime air through our building assemblies and have some drying of potential. It's also very common installation, so lots of crews can um, handle the install and do a really good job um, at installing the exhaust fans and the distribution of the duct system for that exhaust fan. We want a quiet fan and we want to generally have at least a four inch minimum exhaust may be larger if we have a longer way to exhaust that to the exterior. Of course, we don't want that exhausting into the attic space, that moisture. Disadvantage is if we have atmospherically combustion, combustion appliances, we have carbon monoxide potential into the home um, from exhaust-only ventilation. So we really need performance testing to be a part of any uh, home improvement or part of any new structure that's being built. Really uncontrolled air intake location. We don't know where that air is coming from. We know it's coming in because it's going out, and air going out means air coming in. Supply only, some advantages. 
We really have a dedicated intake, so now we can really um, control and condition that intake, whether it's adding or subtracting moisture to it or filtration options. Um, we have more control. That dedicated intake becomes pretty valuable. And with good filtration and conditioning, we can control the outdoor pollutants into the home. Maybe some disadvantages in a cold climate. If we do have uh, end up pressurizing the structure through a supply-only system, in the winter, maybe that has uh, some capacity to push moisture into our assemblies where we don't want it. Again, I haven't necessarily seen large pressure differences result as from supply air systems, but not that it can't happen. Furnace fan operation used to draw outdoor air in. So that's, again, the strategy to bring in supply air is often using this larger capacity blower motor for the forced air furnace. So we might have some additional electrical consumption there um, over, say, an exhaust-only ventilation system. Balanced. So advantages, we do get a greater volume of ventilation achieved. Um, and we may see that with the stack effect, or excuse me, the C-stack demonstration software that I'm going to pull up here next, where the balanced ventilation system, we do get more fresh air brought into our building with the same runtime as an exhaust-only ventilation system in general. No impact to combustion appliances if um, we have it set up appropriate because we have no net pressure difference within that structure. Um, and then obviously the obvious benefit is the heat and moisture recovery capacity that these units have. We do get a little bit higher installation cost and some more space requirements for these installations, but um, if we can work it into the design up front, uh, these are uh, great ways to uh, provide indoor air quality um, throughout the structure. So in closing, I want to go back to uh, the C-Stack demonstration tool. So we saw this before. And we can see, again, up on the top left-hand side, I have a two-story house with 2,000 CFM 50. Right here we have the fan. So I got my, have the cursor on the fan, which is off. We'll click that on in just a minute. We have inside temperature 68, outside temperature 68. No infiltration or exfiltration due to stack effect. And we're going to turn on this exhaust only ventilation system here next. So as I drag this cursor and we have 80 CFM of exhaust in this two-story house, air tightness levels at 2,000 CFM 50. We have very slight pressure changes over on the right-hand side. We're starting to see the blue bars creep in but very low pressure change in this 2000 CFM 50 house. I'm going to make this house tight. So if I change my CFM leakage rate from 2000 to 1000, the pressure difference between inside and outside increase to negative one Pascal. And still not a large pressure difference. But let's add in stack effects. So we have one exhaust fan running in this house for an exhaust-only ventilation system. Say it runs 24 hours a day. And now we, in a heating climate and it's cold, it's 21 degrees outside. Um, now we're starting to see some little more significant pressures at the base of our building, negative 4.7. We're increasing. Um, the infiltration low in our structure due to the combination of stack effect and this exhaust only ventilation system. What's interesting to note is I'm going to point you to the 43 here. I'm moving my cursor to 43 added CFM. That's 43 CFM increase in ventilation above and beyond the stack effect. I'm going to shut this exhaust fan off and go back to zero. If I can tune this in right there. We have 
stack effect driving infiltration and ventilation within our house currently alone. And we have 64 CFM of total ventilation. We turn on the exhaust fan, I'll turn it back on, and we get up to about our 80 CFM of exhaust. And now we have 107 CFM of total ventilation. Even though we're exhausting 80 CFM from that exhaust fan, we're only pull, pulling or exhausting 43 CFM above and beyond the stack effect. Now keep that in mind and I'm going to switch to a balanced ventilation system, an ERV. Now I have a balanced ventilation system and I'm going to shut it off. or we're down to about 2 CFM, essentially off. I won't try to peg that right on zero at the moment. But due to stack effect, we have 64 CFM in this two-story structure, 1,000 CFM 50, pretty tight. Now as I add 80 CFM with a balanced ventilation system, we're going to look at the total ventilation um, capacity, the result. So if I get it to 80, let's say it's 80 CFM to the balanced ventilation system, we have a total of 104, 44 CFM. We've actually a added a true 80 CFM above and beyond the stack effect. It's important with an exhaust only system, moving 80 CFM out of the structure, we only added about half, 43 CFM. Balanced ventilation system, we get our true 80 CFM. Often balanced ventilation systems might move a couple hundred or 150 CFM might be a, a little bit more realistic um, total balanced ventilation system flow in and outside the house. Well really in conclusion of this webinar um, one of the concepts that is important to keep in mind is that the physics of what I talked about here in this our webinar is the physics stay the same. Whether we're in a small structure, whether we're in a large structure, we have conduction, convection, and radiation. We have moisture movement through uh, bulk water, capillary action, vapor, trans, uh, vapor diffusion, and air transported uh, water vapor. We do want to make structures tight. Um, it does not sacrifice indoor air quality if we have a, a broader view, if we have a systems approach to our house, um, ventilation systems that have the capacity to um, run as designed if the homeowner chooses to turn them on. All these ventilation systems um, require a level of maintenance and education by the homeowner, um, whether it's the ventilation system or whether it's the heating and cooling, the filtration systems within the home really take some hand-holding to that homeowner to uh, make these structures work so that education um, is key to uh, the occupants of the home. We can design it right, but um, if they're not on board with what they have within their house and are aware of how to operate them well, then our structures may or may not work. Again, the risk level uh, rises without that education. So thank you for visiting the webinar, viewing the webinar. Really appreciate it. I enjoy um, providing uh, the information to you. And I hope you come back to uh, the Energy Center University and uh, view some of the uh, other online uh, demand webinars that are available. And we also have a great host of uh, live viewing webinar opportunities as well. Thank you.